But today, you know, I have the honor of kind of expositing the passage for us today, and it's from Philippians chapter 3. So let me just, um, just jump into our, our passage today and, and read. I'm going to read from chapter 3, verse 1 through 11. So listen to the Word of God. And this is a New Living Translation. Whatever happens, my dear brothers and sisters, rejoice in the Lord. I never get tired of telling you these things, and I do it to safeguard your faith. Watch out for those dogs, those people who do evil, those mutilators who say to you, you must be circumcised to be saved. For we who worship by the Spirit of God are the ones who are truly circumcised, and we rely on what Christ Jesus has done for us. We put no confidence in human effort, though I could have confidence in my own effort if anyone could. Indeed, if others have reason for confidence, it is in their own efforts. I have even more. I was circumcised when I was eight days old. I am a pure-blooded citizen of Israel and a member of the tribe of Benjamin, a real G Hebrew, if there ever was one. I was a member of the Pharisees who demand the strictest obedience to the Jewish law. I was so zealous that I harshly persecuted the church. And as for righteousness, I obeyed the law without fault. I once thought these things were valuable, but now I consider them worthless because of what Christ has done. Yes, everything else is worthless when compared with the infinite value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. For his sake, I have discarded everything else, counting it all as garbage so that I could gain Christ and become one with him. I no longer count my own righteousness through obeying the law. Rather, I become righteous through faith in Christ. For God's way of making us right with himself depends on faith. I want to know Christ and the experience, the mighty power that raised him from the dead. I want to suffer with him, sharing in his death, so that one day or another, I will experience the resurrection from the dead. Says the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. So, um, you know, as we dig in, I want to just um, kind of begin with the word of prayer. So if you, if you would bow with me as, as we pray. God, we ask for your... Spirit, as we gather to look at your word, to hear from you again afresh. May the words of my mouth, meditations of our hearts be acceptable to you, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So, um, some of you know who I am, some of you don't. Um, I, had this, I had this whole setup spiel about how I'm, I'm the long lost brother of Ken and Ian, you know, the brother from a different mother, um, but I, I'm not. Um, so those of you, you know, who are more earnest and solemn, you know, that was a joke. You know, I'm actually not their brother. Um, I'm not Irish or Scottish. Actually, I don't know what their, their background is, but, um, you know, I, as, as we begin, um, and I think I'm going to get a chance to do this probably later on too, but, um, you know, I'm here because God works in mysterious ways, right? Um, about 10 years ago, I think in Chicago, I, I had a lunch with my pastor, and he did, you know, pastors do weird things, right? They just, like, bring up stuff for no reason. And so, you know, I thought I was getting a free meal, and he, we're eating, and then he, he says, you know, I think God's calling you to be a part of a, a church plant. I'm like, no, God's not doing that. <laughs> I, don't, I, don't, I didn't hear that, which is a little crazy. I didn't feel that. Nothing. And um, so he said, you know, what I'd like to do is I'd like to meet with you once in a while and, and um, help, help you think through these things. And I said, not really. No, no thanks. <laughs> but because of that, you know, then I started second guessing and thinking, well, what, what does it in, entail to do something like that? And why would somebody do that anyway? Um, 
And so that was about 10 years ago in Chicago, and, and through weird chance happenings, uh, volunteering in, in summer programs and urban ministry, and you know, God started to do these strange things. And you know, God does that all the time, right? You go, what am I doing now that has any relevance to what I'm really called to do in my life? And I couldn't see it at that time, but there were all these little pieces. God's planting this weird pastor in my life, spending a summer living in, in, in the middle of Lawndale, Chicago, uh, where we were pulled over by cops because we were in the wrong neighborhood. It's a predominantly black neighborhood, and they, they pulled us over because like three Asians and four white college students, and they're like, what are you doing here? And you know, they thought we were here to buy drugs. We're like, no, we're here to serve. And they're like, yeah, right. Give me your ID. And so this is kind of a reverse. And thinking, how is this going to impact later on? Um, and then later, being in New Jersey and thinking, do I really want to live in the suburb of Metro New York City? And about two, two and a half years ago, um, meeting this guy, bald guy with a, with a really long beard named Ian at, at Central because um, I was interviewing for a position at Central and thinking, you know, this, obviously some of you know how that turned out, right? Um, <laughs> but meeting this guy who had a like vision about a desire for doing something, planting something in an area um, in, in Baltimore and, and seeing the hope of Christ flourish. And so that relationship started. Um, he would call me and say, would you be interested in coming to Baltimore? And you know, I lied and I said, yes. But inside I said, no, right? Um, and now, now I'm standing here in front of you, moved our whole family two kids and trying to figure out where we're going to put them in school, realizing there's a lot of um, brokenness and, and systemic issues here in the city of Baltimore, but saying, you know, I choose to be here because God has been working in our lives and he's led us here. And I think for many of us, my story is similar, right? You know, you are here because of that. God has, in, in weird ways, brought you to this place. And um, so that's not my message, really. Um, but the message, I think, it, it resonates a little bit. In, in our passage today, um, you know, Ian did some beautiful work. You know, he, he said, would you, would you preach on Philippians? But by the way, you know, there are three themes that I want you to hit. So, uh, you know, do you remember those three themes that, that reoccur in Philippians? One is the, the advance of the gospel, right? That there is this culture of um, this message going forth that is unstoppable. It's just, it's, it's on its own. It's a movement, and you either get on board or you get out of the way, right? And there's enthusiasm and there's a contagiousness to it. And then the, the second one, the, uh, the impregnable joy, right? I love how Ian uses these words. I have to look it up in the dictionary, like impregnable joy, right? <laughs> you know, it is this joy that is independent of our circumstances and is grounded in something um, otherworldly. And then um, the third one is teamwork, unity. That we, we do this, the advance of the gospel in partnership with one another and with God. Which is a, also a crazy thing too, right? Why does God need our partnership? This is like the junior partner that nobody wants, right? You know, God says, hey, you want to come on board? By the way, there's not much you can do, but I still want you to be my partner. I mean, that, that's the, the crazy thing about how God works allowing us to collaborate. And, and we see that, those three themes. And, and today in our passage, I think Paul's really going to hit on that second one. 
this idea of joy and rejoicing. And so, you know, I wanted to just do, point out three things. Um, three ways I think Paul is trying to say how we rejoice in God. I think the first two is going to be how we don't rejoice in God or that joy is kind of crushed. And then the third one is a reminder of how we do that. And, you know, Paul is, for lack of a better word, he's, he's an ancient nerd, right? He's, he's a professor, teacher, and, uh, you know, a student of the law, so he can't help but, but be in that format. And so he launches, if you look in our passage, there, you see the, the betrayal of his mindset, his Jewish mindset, where he says, you know, rejoice in the Lord, and, you know, I cannot fail to repeat this over and over again, which really echoes the Old Testament um, Shema, right? You, you, I want to take you back Old Testament 101, right? You know, for a good Jew, you're, you're always... Okay. You're always taught in Deuteronomy 6, right? Hear, O Israel, the Lord your God is one. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, soul, strength, and mind. And then how do you do this? Stick it on your forehead, write it, right? Put it on your doorpost, on your gate. Whenever you gather, make sure you tell it to your children because you're going to forget Right. And the, the sad thing, if you read Old Testament, is how the people of Israel continue to forget. It's really sad. Right? How God has shown up, called them the people of God, rescued them, delivered them, loved them, forgiven them, and then say, don't forget. And then, you know, they forget. And then they chase other gods, other idols. And God says, hey, man, that's not cool. But you know what? Come back to me. I love you. You're my people. How can I turn my back on you? Right? And then they come back. And then, you know what? They forget again and again and again and again and again. And so there is this mantra where Paul says, hey, I'm going to repeat this over and over again because... Our human nature is we forget. Just forget, right? And I was just thinking, you know, I have this thing called an iPhone. And really what it functions for me is just a reminder. Things that I forget, right? I write down, I'm going to meet with somebody, and then I forget. And this iPhone r r tells me. And, it, and, and it, it shows up every day and says, hey, don't forget, you're supposed to do this. And here's Paul doing this. And, and the first way I think Paul um, teaches us how we don't rejoice, how we thwart God's rejoicing, um, Paul does this whole long kind of argument about circumcision. And I, and I don't want to go into it too much, but I think Paul's really saying, if you make anything else the center focus of rejoicing other than Christ, then you, you miss the boat. If circumcision is your sign that you rejoice, it's your salvation, it's your mark, your identity, then Paul says you, you missed it. And, and that's not a new thing either. You know, in the Old Testament, uh, prophets continue to say that. Right? Say, they say that God has shown this really cool sign, maybe not so cool sign, of God's promise um, in Genesis 17. And, but the prophets say, you know, it's not, it's not circumcision of the flesh, but it's the circumcision of the heart. Oh, that you would do that. And Ezekiel, the prophet says that again. And then Isaiah says, you know, I'm, I'm going to give you a new heart a new covenant. And, and by the time Christ shows up, Jesus, Jesus says that again too. Right? These were good signs, but they are not of themselves what 
salvation is. What is the source of our rejoicing? And when we make anything other than Christ the source of our rejoicing, Paul calls it what it is. It's, it's junk. It's garbage. And then the, the second one, again, is, is a little bit heavy too. Um, and, and, and there, you know, Paul, Paul's really getting at, um, you know, what I want to say is Paul ups the commitment level. And I don't know if you thought about this, right? You know, if we had to do evangelism to our friends, say, you know, I want to, I want to share with you the love of Christ, and, you know, they really get it, and you see the spark in their eyes and the forgiveness, and then you say, and by the way, to really seal the deal, you have to circumcise yourself. I mean, think about if you had to do evangelism that way. I mean, most of us would be like, no, thank you. Are you talking like metaphorically, like in, our, in my heart? Like, no, f physically, circumcise yourself. I mean, think about, <laughs> think about what that, that entails. You know, in the Old Testament, when God asks Abraham to do that and his whole household, that was a sign of the level of commitment. If you really trust and believe in me, I want your level of commitment to match that. Not just, you know, like wear a bracelet that says, I love Jesus, right? And not just a tattoo, but real commitment. That's sacrificial. That's going to give up something. And you know what Paul says? Paul says, you think that was a high level of commitment? Paul says, I want to take it up all the way. Your life. Give up your life. You think that's a lot of commitment? The commitment that God wants from us is none other than your death. You know, before I go to the third one, you know, as we go, as I was kind of preparing this message, I was thinking, man, this is really heavy. You know, the message is, um, you got to renounce everything, and then you, you got to sacrifice yourself, die. That's a heavy message. That's how we're supposed to rejoice. That is the cent core of our rejoicing, and um, in some ways, Paul shifts. Uh, in, in the latter part of our passage where he says, you know, all of this I consider of no worth except knowing Christ. And in knowing Christ, what is of the most worth, he says, is the power of Christ's resurrection. I want to know that. Um... You know, one of the cool things, um, when I was in Chicago, uh, we would visit, you know, different styles of church and um, living in the south side of Chicago, one of the, obviously, the, the, the big uh, style of church was gospel. And so, you know, you go there and one of the things I recognized similarities with my tradition growing up in a, in a Korean immigrant church was how long the service was. I mean, they're really long, and um, and the, the 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 preacher he would go for hours. I, I, I'm not joking, but they didn't make it as as long and boring because there was music going on. So as he would preach, then there would be a little bit of something singing going on and dancing, and then he would continue, and then more singing, and he thought, okay, it's finally over, and then he would continue and continue, and. Um, and after a while, you know, you, you just have to like start stretching your legs because you realize you're going to be standing there and, and singing and hearing. And, um, and, and some of the gospel songs are, are kind of interesting because um, one of them was like um, the, the, the power of the, the resurrection. 
resurrection power. And, uh, you know, they would shout, resurrection power. And I'm thinking, like, what's a resurrection power? What is that talking about? You know, Holy Spirit power. You know, for us, since we already know the, the, the arc and trajectory of the gospel history, you know, we know Christ came, broke into uh, human history in time and space, did all this, went to the cross, died, and on the third day rose again. We, we, we know that arc. But, you know, when you... Put yourself in the mindset of his disciples and his followers and the people of that time. When somebody dies, that's it. Right? There is no resurrection. You don't come back from the dead. And Paul says this. The power of the resurrection is that Christ overcame the death, the power of sin, and has given, um, changed the course of human history and the world. And we get to participate in that. And that's shocking. We get to participate in the power that resurrected Christ. We participate in that same power, in that same dunamis, that energy that caused Christ to rise from the dead is now at work in us. That's what Paul says. And, and that's, that's the last one. And really, um, that's supposed to be not only shocking, but it's a surprise. And I wish I could take credit for this, but I can't. Because I heard this a long time ago when I was in seminary. There was a visiting pastor from Seattle, Earl Palmer. I, some of you may know he's really famous. Uh, I think he's retired now. Um, but he talked about reading C.S. Lewis and discovering the, the, the real meaning behind rejoicing and joy. And the real meaning behind that is the word surprise. And, you know, he kind of laid out the whole argument that the word there really means this surprise gift. Right? Joy in Greek kara means a, it's a surprise, surprise gift. And there are all these root words that are connected to it. Charis is grace. Paul uses that word. Surprise gift from God of forgiveness and love. Um, and then, you know, if, if you know your Greek and then you attach the you, ooh, which is a good surprise gift, Eucharist, which is communion, but it really means thanksgiving, right? When you receive a good surprise gift, what is our natural response? Wow, thank you, right? I mean, I don't imagine this anymore, but when I was younger, you know, I used to think like, you know, um, if I get straight A's and I get a perfect score on my SAT and I get into Harvard, my parents are going to buy me a Ferrari. I mean, this is, this is not true, right? And, and so you do these mind experiments, like imagine one day I walk in um, to the house from school and, uh, you know, my mom has, has a smile on her face, says, you know, son, because you have worked so hard, I got you something. And she hands me a little key with a little, little horse on it, <laughs> right? And I was like, what is this? She says, go in the garage, so, you know, slowly open the door. And, and in, in this dilapidated garage is this beautiful red Ferrari smiling at me, <laughs> right? And, and, and think about what your response would be, or, or what my response would be to turn to my mom and say, that's right. That's what I deserve. Right? No, 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 that's not how I would respond, right? My response would be on my knees crying, saying, thank you. I don't deserve this. I do. I don't deserve this, but thank you, right? I, there's a natural human response to a good surprise gift. 
And that's the Eucharist, right? That's Thanksgiving. And, you know, in many ways, I think Paul understands this. I think people of faith like C.S. Lewis and Pastor Earl Palmer have, have understood these things and are passing it on to us. The core of the resurrection of Christ is it's, it's a surprise. Jesus says this in John 16. When he's about to go to the cross, he has this last meal, right? Do you remember this passage? And then he does all this teaching. If you read John 15 and 16, it's, it's, like, it's hard to follow because Jesus is saying all these things. And, and it sounds cryptic. Like, you know, in a little while I'm going to go and you're not going to see me. But there's going to be a... a a counselor who comes. You know, what? And then Jesus prays for them. Oh, Lord, you know, watch over them. And you read this, you know, what's going on? And at, at some point, Jesus says, you know, I'm the vine, you're the branches, and um, follow me. Remain in me and follow my command, love one another. And, you know, in a little while, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to be gone, and the whole world will grieve but your grief will turn to joy. You know what that is, right? You are, on that Friday night, you're going to hide because the whole world has collapsed. And everything you staked your life on, you're going to say it's wrong because Christ is dead. And everyone will rejoice and you will grieve. And then on Sunday, these ladies are going to go and come back and tell you something and you won't believe it. And one of you may run over there and check it out. And you still, some of you named Thomas, you just won't believe it. But I'm going to show up. And your grief will will turn to surprise. I'm going to surprise you. And the response to that is joy, is rejoicing. Right? Because when somebody says, hey, rejoice in the Lord always, and you don't really experience the power of Christ's resurrection in your life, the surprise that Christ overcame death and loved us, loved you, if you don't know that, and somebody says, rejoice in the Lord, and, and you go to church and you s sing these songs, and I rejoice in the Lord, and, you know, in the back of your mind, you're like, not really. I don't even know what I'm saying about. I'm, I'm going to act all happy and pretend. But if you know the surprise of the resurrection, even if you've had a rough week, rough day and you show up to church and you're like how did I end up coming here it's a hot day I'm a little sleepy and and the worship team is leading us in the song I don't know the words exactly and then you start to get caught up in the words and it says rejoice in the Lord you know Christ is victorious he's forgiven us the, the love that we, we experience and, and then we remember the surprise of God and then it's different, right? Then we really experience joy and rejoicing and it's not just a feeling, right? It's not just an emotion. It's rooted in something. Something historic, something transformative, something powerful. I think that's what Paul was really driving at. But because he's a teacher and a nerd, you know, he had to put in the first two, right? Don't forget, you know, circumcision is not all that, right? And in fact, God requires even more than that. There's idols in our lives that we make into God, and it's not Christ. So check yourself, right? Whatever you think makes you righteous is not. If you're coming to church 100% attendance rate, that's not salvation, right? If you're tithing a lot, that's not salvation, right? If you're volunteering and being nice to other people, that's really great, but that's not salvation. 
It's, it's in Christ, in the power of the resurrection of Christ. And then Paul does that second thing, right? And it requires not just a little bit, not just a lot, but everything. But Paul says, that's cool. Because the joy in Christ is everything. And, um, you know, C.S. Lewis says this. I, I, you know, I wish I could um, write like him, but <laughs> I can't. <laughs> uh, there's a quote from um, his autobiography which is called Surprised by Joy which makes me think that he understood what the word joy meant because he was surprised by joy right? that's how he came to know Christ and so you know he's a, he's a super nerd so he's like playing on words surprised by surprise um, and then later he, he marries this woman named Joy and that's purely coincidence but it's kind of shocking right the surprise by God's surprise. Um, and one of the things he says is that, and I think I didn't print out the quote, but um, I'll just paraphrase. You know, he says that uh, in his search for joy, it goes something like, um, the, the interesting characteristic about joy is that um, you can't produce it. It's unexpected. It's one of the pleasures that you cannot manufacture, no matter how hard you try. Because the nature of it is that it's, it's a surprise. It's unexpected. Um, but the, the quality, he says, is that once you've experienced that, you are continually wanting to seek that again and again and again. And that's God, right? If you can remember back to how you experienced the power and the presence and the forgiveness and the grace and love of God, for many of us, it's just it's so brief. Maybe it's because we are a finite and and God's love is infinite, and so we just get a, a brief glimpse of it, right? And then when we've tasted that joy, we're like, I need, I need that again. And it's not always there in our lives. But just the, the memory of it and the reminder of it is powerful enough to drive our lives. Um, you know, I wanted to end and then, you know, transition into our communion time and um, you know, when I was in college, I, I roommated with um, three other guys, partly because we're, we just wanted to save money. So we found this apartment, and we just, like, crammed in. And, um, you know, four guys in college, is, that's, that's not a good setup. You know, because, you know, I didn't know how to do laundry. Um, first time I went to college, you know, I was like, my clothes are all dirty. So, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm thinking, like, I'm a, I'm a smart guy, so I got to wash this. So I went to the laundromat, and, uh, you know, they, back then it was like two quarters, right? So you put two quarters and you slide it in. And so I threw all my clothes in, and then, um, then they have these little dispensers. You buy the detergent, and then you wash it, and then, then you dry it, right? So I look at it and go, this is easy. It's a big deal. And then, you know, as I was pulling my clothes out, I realized I didn't know I had pink clothes. You know, like, all my whites had turned pink. And I was like, this is strange. So, you know, I remember this very distinctly. I called my mom, and not on a cell phone, because it didn't exist back then, right? And they're like, doot, doot, doot. Um, and I said, you know, I did laundry today, but all my whites turned pink. Why, why is that? And she says, you have to separate the whites and the colors. And I'm like, why? Because I would have to do two loads. That would cost me twice as much, right? <laughs> this is my thought process. And then she's like, that's how I always do it. And I go, really? I never knew that. And so, you know, these are little things that, you know, um, that four guys living together, you know, we don't think about. 
and we didn't think about how we would eat. Because to save money, we didn't sign up for you know, the school dorm lunch plan. We said, we'll just cook. And, uh, and in my head, it's like, someone will cook. <laughs> Not me, but someone will. Because you know, at home, when it's dinner time, I sit down and there's food, right? So, uh, you know, I remember the, the first week, you know, I was like, I came home after class, um, and I was hungry, and we had this table that we, we got for free at a, a dumpster, so we found it and, you know, we dragged it in, and then I sat down, and I was like, where's the food, all right? And then the four of us were all looking at each other like, where's the food? <laughs> and then um, Eddie, who was the more pragmatic person, said, did anyone go to the grocery store? <laughs> and I was like, why? why? Why would I go to the grocery store? Oh, you mean pick up food. Did anyone pick up food? Nobody picked up food? Nobody, nobody, no one's cooking? And then we realized we didn't even have knives. We didn't, we didn't, we didn't have like cooking utensils. And so we had to, uh, try to figure these things out. And um, I'm not going to go too much into details of my college life, but um, one of the things that um, through all those difficulties of learning to live life, um, there, was, there was kind of a, a bond of friendship. And so, you know, we would try to do things like um, um, buy birthday presents and and so, um, one of my roommates, he took me to, to Wheaton, that's kind of West Chicago, and got me a ticket to a, a Christian concert at Wheaton University College. And, you know, so he said, for your birthday, I got these tickets. And um, I was really... I was really surprised and moved, but at the same time, I was like, that's not what I really want. <laughs> but, you know, I thought, hey, that's cool. Um, so the four of us, we um, asked our other friend who had a car because we didn't have a car. I said, can you drive us? So we, we drove and we went to this Christian concert. And um, then we came home. And, and I thought, you didn't even take me out to eat hamburger. I was like, man, that's messed up. But you know what? We're, we're all poor anyway. So, you know, I should be grateful for the fact that he bought these $10 tickets. Because $10 was a lot of money for us back then. And um, so we came home and, you know, I had mixed feelings. Like, I was, I was grateful for this, but at the same time, you know, I thought, you know what I did for your birthday, man? You know, I got you, like, I got you CDs, right? <laughs> Music that you really wanted, um, that you could listen to over and over. But, you know, a concert, it's, it's a one-time deal. You know, it's in my memory, but I can't play that over and over again. Um, so I remember taking the elevator up. We lived on the 32nd floor. And so it took a while to get up there. And it's a long hallway, and we lived at the end of the apartment complex and I walked in and um, I opened the door and as I was walking in I saw a flash and I was that's really strange and then I realized my roommates were acting really weird and then all of a sudden um, people jumped out and they were like I, I don't remember exactly but somebody was pulling at my shirt and somebody jumped on top of me, and then there was some singing. And what had happened was th that that concert was a ruse, right? It was like a distraction. And so what they did was, while we were out, the, all, they had uh, coordinated all these friends of ours to come to our tiny little apartment. Uh, I don't remember exactly, like 30, 40 people in this tiny little apartment. They were all jammed, packed in there, and they were all trying to hide, right? <laughs> right? <laughs> And so they were like jumping out of the closet. And so while we were away, they, they had done all that. And then they had planned this birthday surprise party with food and everything. And, 
And so, you know, I was distracted because in my head I was just kind of thinking about all these things. And what I had failed to realize was that my roommates were all like secretly, silently whispering to each other. And, and I should have known something was up. Um, and so when I opened the door and everybody jumped out. And I have a picture of it. Because, you know, back then we didn't have iPhones and we didn't have thousands of pictures. I have one picture of that moment that I found. And it's, and it's me, like, in this weird pose and somebody pulling my shirt and there's a guy about to <laughs> tackle me. And the look on my face is uh, somewhere between startled and, and overjoyed. You know, when... When you remember a moment where you were truly surprised, you can't hide it. You, know, you, tr you can try to act cool and say like, yeah, this is all right, you know, okay, cool. But if you're truly surprised, your facial expression cannot hide it. In fact, there's a, a famous psychologist, Paul Ekman, he uh, later on made this TV show, Lie to Me, about micro expressions. And uh, so he did studies on this. And one of the, the major emotions, feelings that he studied was surprise. And the way it's characterized is that your eyes get really big, your, your eyebrows go up, usually your jaw drops, and, um, and that's the expression of surprise, right? Because if somebody jumps out and, and surprises you, you don't go like, hey, right? <laughs> then you, you know you were expecting it, right? And, and he kind of elaborates more on that. that and, and in some ways, it, this may be theoretical, but it kind of makes sense that the, the raising of the eyebrows the, the opening of the eyes and, and that expression is, in, in some sense, um, this desire when we experience surprise and joy, our attention is heightened, our focus is, is heightened, and there is there's a sense of trying to understand fully what's going on, trying to get at the answers. And I thought, that's, that's really interesting, right? When we experience surprise joy, there is a natural response in us to want to seek out what's happening. When we are surprised by the resurrection of Christ, the natural response is trying to figure out the truth behind that. Why did Christ do that? Why does he love me? Why did he die for me? Why did he forgive me? And then we start to peel away at the layer and the truth behind the good news, the gospel. That the creator of the universe did not abandon us, but who calls us back home, who loves us, who sent his only son and in, in the face of shame and suffering, finds a way for us. You know, every time we are surprised, every time we rejoice, we are drawn to seek out Christ and know more and more about the truth behind that. And it's this natural cycle. And sometimes we get stuck in life and it's... It gets, really, it gets really hard. And in the midst of difficulty, God shows up and we're reminded to rejoice. Not in our feelings and our emotions, but to go back to the power of the resurrection and then God does something surprising. God gives us this resource. And I think that's, that's one of the best ways to think about it. God's joy is the resource we need in this journey of faith. Because it's too hard. Right? It's too hard. I mean, some of, you, some of you are too young, right? 
to know that you know as you age and go through life, it's not it's not all that great. There's a period where you're just thinking, for real, this is it. God, you want me to go through this kind of stuff in my life? Why are you making it so difficult? And God gives us this resource. You know, John 15 says, when Jesus is about to leave the disciples, he says, um, abide in me. You are, you are my friends. And I've called you friends because everything I know from the Father I've made known to you. So this is my command. Love one another. And then Jesus says this, right? Um, I want you to have my joy and have it fully, completely. And, uh, if you ever read that passage, it's just a weird, weird point where Jesus inserts that. And, and, and I think Jesus does that to remind his disciples, you know, as you follow me, it's going to get really hard. But remember, I'm always going to be there to supply you with this resource. I'm never going to ask you to do something without giving you the resource and power to do it. Right? I'm never going to call you to a place, a city called Baltimore, and not help you find supporters. Right? I'm never going to ask you to serve without giving you the ability to experience grace and forgiveness. I'm never going to ask you to follow me and give up your life if I'm not going to if I'm not going to walk with you in this journey. So, um, you know, as we transition to um, communion time, you know, I want to encourage you and remind you: this is the Lord's table, where it is not a ritual but it's a reminder of the power of Christ's resurrection. And when we participate in this, God reminds us again of God's joy. And we, we take of this, and then we respond to Christ, and we say, God, thank you. Thank you for what you've done in my life. Thank you for the reminder and the surprise of joy in my life. And so... Uh, on the night that Christ was betrayed, he took bread and he broke it. And he said, this is my body broken for you. And in the same, same manner, he took the cup and he said, this is a new covenant and this is my blood poured out for you for the forgiveness of sins. For as often as you meet and you do this, you proclaim the death and resurrection of our Lord Jesus Christ. So I want to invite um, I want to invite those who are participating in um, communion to come up and you know as as you come up to participate you know, we encourage at St. Mo's to come in community, uh, in groups, in people around you. And, and today, as, as you partake in this, you know, I hope we are reminded again. I hope you are reminded of the power of Christ's resurrection, the power of that surprise and the source of our joy that resource that Christ gives so that we can continue on this journey, so we can do this together as a community, as a church, to bring the hope of Christ, shed light into the city, into this world.